Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar uh, here on reducing holiday stress. My name is Jacob Mursky. I'm a internist and primary care physician at MGH in the Revere Healthcare Center. I'm also the medical director for the DGIM Healthy Lifestyle Program. I'm excited to have you here and to talk about stress reduction during the holidays. And I'm just going to start off by giving a couple of brief um, uh, mentioned here to a couple of brief items uh, related to today's webinar. Um, so this webinar will not run the full hour. This will be 45 minutes at most. Uh, I have some information I'm planning to cover around stress management, stress reduction during the holiday seasons, um, but definitely want to leave plenty of time for your questions. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for um, watching after today. Uh, as a participant, your video and audio are off and cannot be connected to this webinar. And we do encourage that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature or send a chat, not to everybody, but just to the host and panelists. So I want to start today just by setting the stage to say that we all experience stress. Uh, what I'd like to do is just to start the webinar by talking about what stress actually is, because that will set the stage for talking about stress management and stress reduction. So stress is the mind and the body's response to any demand. These can be small daily demands that we encounter from the moment we get up to the moment that we go to bed, and sometimes after we go to bed. And on the other hand, these demands can be major life events, such as the death of a loved one or the loss of a job. So stress is pervasive. But fortunately, there are many ways that we can reduce stress. So what I'm showing here is a diagram from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, lifestyle medicine is an evidence-based approach to preventing, treating, and even reversing disease, or in this case, stress-associated symptoms. And even though developing strategies to reduce stress is one of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, each of the other pill pillars are effective ways to bring stress levels down. So today, what we are going to focus on is both strategies to reduce stress management, shown here in blue. But I'm also going to emphasize that these other six pillars of lifestyle medicine are critically important for a healthy lifestyle overall, but for stress management in particular. So to start, let's talk about the stress reduction. Uh, to start talking about stress reduction, let's talk about how stress impacts our minds and our bodies. And in order to do that, we do have to speak a little bit about the science of stress. So animals evolved to respond to stress. And biologically speaking, what I'm talking about here is either acute stress or chronic stress. And so animals evolved to respond to acute stress so that we could respond to threats that we perceive in the world. The stress response is called the fight or flight or freeze response. And this was characterized uh, over a hundred years ago in animals. Broadly speaking, it is an evolutionarily conserved, physiological, behavioral, and psychological state of hyper arousal in response to an environmental challenge or stressor that requires adjustment of our behavior. The purpose of the stress response is to empower us to deal with threats to survival and to reestablish equilibrium, which is to say it gets us back to whatever it is that we believe or feel to be normal and safe. So activation of the stress response is thus a protective and short-term evolutionary tool that we have to survive. Now the stress response is initiated by activation of the amygdala, which is shown here in the brain at the base or the bottom. The amygdala perceives a real or imagined threat, either physical or emotional, and in response to amygdala activation, a cascade of stress-related changes takes place throughout the brain and body, including the release of the stress hormone cortisol from the adrenal glands shown here on the right. There's also the release of neurotransmitters such as adrenaline and noradrenaline, and this causes the body to experience all sorts of acute changes to help us deal with the stressor. Our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate goes up, our digestion is turned off and our immune system is changed uh, because in the moment of acute stress, we don't need to focus our energy on either digesting food or fighting an infection. Again, each of these changes is meant to prepare us for a fight or a flight, 
with the ultimate hope that when the acute stressor is addressed, we will return to a place of normalcy. However, if the acute stressor is not fully dealt with and becomes chronic, such as a wound that doesn't heal or a persistently lurking tiger in the distance, then each of these physiologic changes too persists and becomes chronic. Some of these chronic changes, such as a heart beating real fast or fevers and chills in response to an infection, become yet another change or stressor that requires our attention and adjustments in our behavior. And so a feedback loop begins where the symptoms of chronic stress become drivers of additional stress on top of the original stressors that we experience. And this in turn leads to chronic physiologic changes that drive even more chronic stress. So in this way, chronic stress begins to wear and tear on the mind and the body. Now this is what we see in modern life too. So instead of these prehistoric dangers that our bodies evolved to deal with many, many years ago, we now live with many chronic, unrelenting social and societal stressors that perpetuate the stress response in powerful ways. Physical illness, mental illness, traumas, financial difficulties, relational and marital problems are everywhere. And so our collective stress response is always turned on. Over time, we see profound effects on the body that extend far beyond these transient elevations of blood pressure or decreases in digestion that we talked about earlier. What were once selectively advantageous adaptations of the acute stress response actually become disease producing changes in response to chronic stress. So for example, our ability to selectively conserve energy in response to the threat of starvation has led in our current times to obesity. Our ability to conserve fluids and electrolytes in response to dehydration has led to hypertension or high blood pressure. Our ability to become aroused and fearful in response to adversities has led to anxiety and insomnia. And our withdrawal from social situations that pose dangers now is experienced as depression. Moreover, chronic stress increases the likelihood of health damaging behaviors, such as eating comfort foods, sedentary lifestyles, smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol. And again, these chronic physiologic or body changes produce additional burdens for us to respond to, increasing our already high stress levels and perpetuating this stress symptom cycle. Now take a moment here to highlight that even though the holiday season is meant to be full of cheer and joy, and that's what we see on the streets and stores and on TV, the reality is that holiday time, it brings a number of unique stressors to many of us. Uh, first of all, it's worth mentioning that with the surge of COVID-19 cases from the Omicron variant right now, many of us are experiencing additional stress related to the holiday season in that context. But in general, the holidays can also bring up stress related to family and friends, financial stressors to some of the costs associated with buying gifts or dinners uh, out with, with friends and family. There are end of year work deadlines that some of us have to contend with. At least in the Boston area, there are cold and dark days that can be very stressful for many people. Travel in general can certainly exacerbate stress. And for many people, the holiday season is a time where isolation and loneliness is felt very deeply. So I highlight this just to say that stress is something that we know a lot about and we are empowered to deal with. Uh, and so what I wanna shift attention to now is what we can actually take advantage of in this effort to think about stress reduction. So the good news is that our body has a natural anti-stress response and this is called the relaxation response. Its discovery dates back over 50 years here at Massachusetts General Hospital. So as a young cardiologist, Dr. Dr. Herbert Benson, founder of the MGH Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine, noticed a trend among his patients with high blood pressure. As he put it, quote, it was widely known that when measured in a doctor's office, a patient's blood pressure was often higher than when it was measured by the patient himself or herself at home or in other settings. 
Yet the medical literature failed to explain this discrepancy sufficiently, and none of my colleagues seemed bothered by it. I speculated that patients exhibited falsely high levels in doctor's offices because they were nervous and that there might be a relationship between stress and high blood pressure. Though it seems unmistakable to us today with the clue of the word tension embedded in hypertension, no one in medicine had yet explored the correlations between stress and elevations in blood pressure, even though high blood pressure was a primary contributor to the nation's leading cause of death. Dr. Benson and his colleagues began studying this connection. And in the very room at Harvard Medical School where the stress response was discovered 50 years earlier, Dr. Benson and Robert Keith Wallace discovered the opposite. Specifically, by studying research subjects with well-developed meditation practices, they found a state of reduced energy use in the body or metabolism, reduced breathing rates, reduced heart rates, and more relaxed brain activity. Dr. Benson labeled these changes the relaxation response and published a paper on this topic shown here in February of 1974. Dr. Benson proposed this relaxation response as an alternative innate reaction to stress. Through further study, he and his colleagues identified a wide range of activities that elicited or brought out the relaxation response, such as yoga, breath or mindful awareness, and progressive muscle relaxation. And they described the two universal basic steps to elicit the relaxation response shown here. The first is to focus our attention on something that's repeated or linear, that's neutral or positive, such as a repeated sound, a repeated word, a phrase, prayer, or movement. The second part of any relaxation response practice is to be aware of thoughts that intrude on this focus and to passively set them aside by returning the attention to focus on whatever it is that we are bringing our awareness to. So what I'd like to do now is take a brief moment to practice the relaxation response so that each of you has a sense of what this feels like and can use this as the basis, perhaps for some stress reduction practices after today's webinar. So we're gonna practice a brief breath focused meditation. When I use the term meditation, I don't mean this in a religious or spiritual context, although many of the things that we've learned about meditation practice actually come from those traditions. But instead, we'll use meditation in a more medical or scientific context here, focusing on a, as a way to bring out the relaxation response. So to prepare for a breath-focused meditation, I invite you to sit comfortably in your chair. Put your feet firm on the ground. Make your spine upright and straight if that's possible and comfortable for you. You can put your hands on your lap with your palms up towards the sky. And if you feel okay doing so, you can gently close your eyes. Now I invite you to take some deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth with the intention of just bringing awareness to what your body feels like right now in this moment. So a deep breath in and notice where in your body you feel the breath. Is it in your head, your nose, your mouth, your throat, your chest or your belly? And breathe out. Take one more deep breath in through the nose and again, notice where in your body you feel it the most and breathe out. And now I invite you to breathe gently in through the nose and out through the mouth at a calm, comfortable, relaxed pace. Now the focus of this meditation is on the breath and I invite you specifically to put your focus where in the body you felt the breath the most just before. The purpose is not to judge or to think or to question. The goal here is just to focus on the sensation of what the breath feels like in your body with every in-breath and what you feel 
with every outbreath. Now, as I mentioned before, the mind wanders, and that's perfectly normal. The second key part of the relaxation response is to build an awareness that the mind has wandered and to bring the attention back to the object of our focus, which in this case is the breath. Again, you might've noticed that your mind has wandered. That's perfectly okay. Be aware of that, let go of the thoughts and return your awareness back to the breath and the sensations in your body. Now, if it feels comfortable for you, you can bring your attention back to the room, the feeling of your feet on the ground or the chair beneath you, any sounds or smells that you might be aware of. And if your eyes are closed, you can gently open them. So this sensation that you're experiencing right now is the relaxation response. In contrast, to activation of the brain in the amygdala, the lower parts of the brain that we talked about before, the relaxation response activates a different part of the brain. You are choosing to activate different parts of your brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, the front parts of the brain that are shown here in blue and green. These parts of our brain are uniquely mammalian, meaning we only see these in mammals, and they're responsible for rational thinking, compassion, and forethought. We know that the relaxation response changes our bodies in a way that is opposite to the stress response. We have decreased activation of the parts of the nervous system that respond to threats. And as a result, we experience lowering of blood pressure and heart rate and more beneficial, healthy changes in digestion and immune system. And in contrast to how the stress response produces physiologic or body changes that tax us and increase our stress above baseline, the relaxation response returns our body to normal. And not only does the relaxation response not stress or exacerbate the problem in the first place, it actually lowers the stress that we experience at the heart of the matter. So in 1974, that article I showed before from Dr. Benson, he indicated that, quote, only preliminary objective data exist at the present time, which established the place of the relaxation response in medicine, end quote. And in the decades since then, the relaxation response has become a key component of mind-body research and clinical programs. And in fact, we now know how to use the concepts of the stress response and the relaxation response to help patients but unfortunately, few people know how to benefit from the strengths of the relaxation response, and few know tools, strategies, and techniques to effectively lower the stress response. And so many of us are walking around with unchecked, unrelenting chronic stress and experience the health consequences of doing so. So I'd like to shift gears now and talk about what can I do, what can you do to bring this into balance? The vision of successful stress management is both to reduce activation of the stress response, which I'll talk about first, and then to enhance the power of the relaxation response so that our nervous system is not tipped into the chronic stress reaction. The way that this is accomplished is in two steps. The first, is developing the capacity or the ability to become aware of our stress. The second is to build adaptations that bring the stress and the relaxation responses more in line. And as a result, from the brain perspective, we wanna shift our brain as much as possible 
from living in a place where our bottom parts, including the amygdala, are activated in response to fear, and to be able to choose to activate the front parts that are more focused on planning, compassion, and positivity. So let's talk for a brief moment about building awareness of our stress response. This is a critical first step for reducing stress. Encourage you to all think about yourself as having stress warning signs, something analogous to a therm thermometer or thermostat. We all experience stress in very different ways, but each of us has a thumbprint, some sort of typical way that we deal with stress or we experience stress. For some people, it's usually more physical, such as a migraine, an upset stomach, or a worsening of chronic pain. For some people, it's cognitive, meaning a mental fog, confusion, or more negative thinking. For some people, stress comes out more emotionally as anger or fear or distrust. For some people, stress is present. We know it's present when our behaviors change. We watch more TV or we drink more alcohol or we go online on to social media, or if we stop connecting with friends or family. And finally, some people experience stress and know that their stress levels are high in a relational context. They become more irritable or less understanding of friends, family, coworkers, or neighbors. So when we talk about the stress warning signs, I encourage you to think about your mind and your body being similar to a thermostat. So just like a thermostat has a set point of let's say here 72 degrees, if the temperature rises, the thermostat knows to then activate a plan for bringing the temperature down. In this case, the plan is to turn on an air conditioning. And our minds and our bodies are actually very, very similar. But if we don't have the awareness that our stress levels are increasing or rising, then it's impossible for us to then put in place the tools, strategies, and techniques that will bring stress levels down. So again, the stress warning signs are our way of knowing that our stress levels are going up. And that's really valuable and meaningful because then that allows us to put in place the tools, strategies, and techniques to bring our stress levels down. And so what are those ways that we can actually bring our stress levels down? Well, that's what these six pillars of lifestyle medicine I showed before are, are listed here. Now, I'm just going to highlight at first two of the pillars, which many people don't traditionally think of as ways that we can lower the temperature or reduce stress levels. The first is through nutrition. So nutrition is actually a very important mediator or influencer of how our mind and body are experiencing the world around us. And this is because serotonin, which is the neurotransmitter or brain hormone that's responsible for sleep, appetite, mood, and pain, 95% of it is actually produced in the gastrointestinal tract. So the gut, is really important for our brain health and for our mood, sleep, and pain levels. Another important point is that we have this brain-gut access, which means that our brain and our gut are very closely connected and are in constant communication. And this is supported by recognizing that outside of the brain and the spinal cord, the largest collection of nerve cells is actually in the gut. Not only that, but our gut is home to billions of bacteria, many of them good bacteria, which we call the microbiome. And the relationship between the brain, the gut, and the microbiome is critically important for our overall brain health. We know this through a lot of research from the past 10 or 20 years, looking at the brain-gut axis that has shown the negative or detrimental effects of unhealthy foods. In particular, what we know is that processed foods, which contain a lot of chemicals and few plant-based 
components lead to inflammation in the gut. This causes a dysregulation or an unhealthy balance of the gut microbiome. And as a result, this contributes to disease. And it's only recently that we're starting to look at the other side of the coin and recognizing that food has a very powerful impact in improving our mood and brain health. We now believe that more plant-based foods and in particular whole foods or unprocessed foods are anti-inflammatory. They turn off those inflammatory signals that processed foods turn on. That leads to healthier regulation of the gut microbiome and that promotes our brain health and our stress reduction. This is supported by some areas of research shown here on the right. First, just to highlight that the Mediterranean diet and Japanese diet have been studied. Both are heavily influenced by plant-based foods and fewer processed foods. And both of those diets have about a one quarter to one third reduction in depression rates for people who adhere to those diets relative to American diets. There also recently was a research study called the SMILES trial that included participants with moderate to severe depression. For 12 weeks, participants received nutritional counseling sessions and they had improved stress and mood symptoms at the end of the study. So nutrition is one of the ways that even if we're not thinking about it as a stress reduction practice, actually has a big impact on our nervous system health and how we experience stress in the world. The other pillar that I wanna highlight from a stress reduction perspective is physical activity. So many people do physical activity, whether it's exercise at the gym or outside for reasons beyond stress reduction. This could be for weight loss, lowering blood pressure, improving diabetes or blood sugar levels. But in fact, physical activity is one of the most powerful tools that we have for lowering stress levels. Evidence for this comes out of the American Psychological Association, which studied about 2,000 American adults and reported that exercise is actually twice as effective at reducing stress levels relative to going online or spending time on social media or watching TV or movies. So even though many of us in our culture and our society reflexively think about sitting on a couch, using the phone, watching TV as a way to de-stress or to relax. In fact, the most powerful thing that we could all do is to get some more physical activity. So these are just two ways in which we can start to shift our brain health and our stress management from the stress response, activation of the lower part of the brain, to the relaxation response with activation of the front part of the brain. An important piece of this conversation though is how to activate the relaxation response to provide more specific health benefits. So increasing the relaxation response again, just relies on any practice or routine that has these two key components. Focusing on something that is a object of our attention that is repeated or linear and either neutral or positive. So this can be yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, running, cycling, swimming. And for many people, even crafts or cooking is something that we know feels good to us, but the relaxation response is a way to describe why it feels good to us. For those of you who are interested in exploring the relaxation response more in your own time, in your own way, these are a list of just four commonly used apps that I hear about from many of my patients and I've tried out as well that have free content that you could explore during this time. Regardless of whatever practice you decide to choose or to introduce into your daily routine, what's most important is to develop a regular practice, even if it's just for a few minutes. So a meditation practice for three minutes or five minutes every morning is gonna provide much more benefit than a 30 minute meditation practice once on the weekend. The regular practice sets the stage to build up more and more time and expertise over in the future. But for now, for those of you who are interested in starting out with a meditation practice, 
starting with an app and using a regular routine is one of the best ways to see success. Another way to activate the front part of the brain that is very reliable and for many patients very successful is starting a gratitude journal. A gratitude journal is a simple way to shift the mind's activity from negativity to positivity. And what I recommend for a gratitude journal is to use the standard approach of writing down every day three things that you feel grateful for. And in fact, it's most effective to start each of those three things by writing down, I am grateful for, and then putting whatever it is that you're grateful for. This type of practice has been shown to increase positive thinking, to increase connectivity among friends and family, and to actually reduce depressive symptoms. I invite you now to take just a moment in the midst of what for many of you is likely a busy work day with the holidays here to think about one thing in a positive light that you are grateful for. It could be a friend, a family member, a gift, an opportunity, or something physical. And say to yourself, you could even repeat it, I am grateful for, and then list whatever it is. So in summary, our focus on stress management is to think about both reducing the weight of the stress response, also called the fight, flight, or freeze response, and to activate the relaxation response so that the two balance out. And so if you're thinking about, well, this sounds good, what can I actually do? I'll return to this concept of developing some behaviors now because stress levels are generally high, but to not do too much at once. So in our Healthy Lifestyle program, we have two wonderful health and wellness coaches, and we talk all the time about setting what we call SMART goals, which are specific, measurable goals that are realistic to obtain or to accomplish in a short period of time. Another more concrete way to put this, no pun intended, is to think about a behavior change as a brick. So if you wanted to build a brick wall that is strong and can withstand the forces of chronic stress, one brick at a time is what's ultimately gonna get you to the place that you wanna be. And so over the next 10 days, for example, as the holidays peak with Christmas, New Year's, I invite you to think about what's one brick that you could lay in your wall that might help reduce stress for you over the holidays. Now, I'm just gonna give a few examples of what that might look like. Again, thinking about specific, small goals that you could readily accomplish within the next few days. So from a nutrition perspective, perhaps instead of filling a plate with pastries, either at dinner or at a holiday party, perhaps you'll first fill the plate with fruit instead. From a substance perspective, and this could be alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, sugar, instead of drinking a cocktail before dinner, perhaps you could consider enjoying a cup of tea. For physical activity, perhaps instead of reading the news online each morning, you could instead walk for 15 minutes. For sleep, perhaps instead of falling asleep on the couch before bed, maybe watching TV, you could set a goal of getting into bed at 10 o'clock. For stress reduction, instead of watching TV in the morning before you go to work, perhaps trying a breathing meditation. And perhaps most importantly, during this holiday season, focusing on relationships. So instead of engaging in social contact that is passive, virtual, such as going on online onto Facebook, perhaps this is something you can commit to today or over the next few days to call a friend or a family member that you care about. And hopefully as time goes on, you'll start to enjoy many of the benefits of focusing on these six pillars of healthy lifestyle and as the holiday season progresses into the new year, hopefully you'll build up a brick wall for yourself. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm going to pause here. We've left 10 minutes for questions. 
I'm going to invite uh, Anna Baggett, who is our health and wellness coach at the Revere Practice and a member of our Healthy Lifestyle Program, uh, to coordinate a couple questions. Thank you, Dr. Mursky. That was very informative and perfectly timed for the holiday season. Um, so as he mentioned earlier, you can put a question in the Q&A or in the chat to host and panels. Um, so to start out, what is the minimum amount of meditation practice that I need in order to get a benefit? Yeah, so that's a great question, a common question that comes up uh, all the time. Um, so meditation practices, as I mentioned before, can bring out a benefit in as little as two or three minutes. Um, the challenge with a short practice like two or three minutes is that whatever benefit is received quickly goes away. And so most people benefit them, the, get the biggest benefit or experience that benefit with at least five or 10 minutes of practice. Uh, but we recommend uh, in general aiming for ultimately up to 15 or 20 minutes of meditation practice once or perhaps if possible twice a day. Um, there was a comment that said, thank you for an awesome and informative presentation. And we do have another question. Um, can mind and body medicine be a part of medical care at MGH? Yes, it absolutely can. And in many ways, I think it should. Um, so at MGH, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're fortunate to have the Benson Henry Institute for Mind Body Medicine. Um, this is available for all MGH patients and also for patients outside of MGH as well. Um, and many primary care doctors uh, who are part of the Healthy Lifestyle Program also have a strong interest in uh, mind body medicine. Um, so we will continue to put more information about this on our Healthy Lifestyle Program website. Uh, but if you are a patient at MGH, I certainly encourage you to talk with your providers, whether it's primary care or specialists, uh, about my body medicine, in particular about the Benson Henry Institute. Thank you so much, Dr. Mersky. All right, great. Well, thank you, Anna. And we'll finish up here just with a reminder um, that we are going to have one more webinar focused on healthy lifestyle around the holiday seasons. Um, this is going to be conducted by the other health and wellness coach that we have in the Healthy Lifestyle Program, Katie Engels, um, who's currently at the Beacon Hill Primary Care Practice. Um, this webinar is going to be on Thursday, January 13th at 6 p.m. And as a reminder, this will also be recorded and available on our website afterwards. Um, finally, we would love your feedback to learn more about uh, your experience with today's webinar. This is actually only the second webinar that our Healthy Lifestyle Program has done. So we want to do more and we want to learn from you. Um, so Anna is going to put a link in the chat, uh, which you can click on. This is a opportunity to give us direct feedback to inform future programs that we do. Um, so Anna, thank you for putting it there. So if you look in the chat, there is a link to a website that's called RedCap. I just ask that you please click on that link now because when we end the webinar, the chat and the link will disappear. Um, so please take uh, the next few seconds to click on the link um, so it'll open up and then we'll end the webinar in just a few moments. So thank you very much for attending. It's a pleasure to share this information uh, and uh, wanna just close by wishing everyone a very healthy uh, and happy end of the year and holiday season. Thank you. <laughs>